Uh, so we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're actually on part six. So we put all of our talks up on YouTube and on all the digital platforms. So if you've uh, missed any of them, you can go back and, and catch up there. We basically have been looking at this book, and, and I love it because Paul, he writes to the church in Corinth, and he's really writing back to them after they wrote him some concerns and some problems. Um, he had some people that were reporting just some of the, the chaos and dysfunction that was happening in the church. And like I've said every week, uh, we're the same, right? People haven't changed. We still have our issues. We still have our junk. Uh, church is messy. And the reason it's messy, you guys remember why it's messy? Because we're in the room, right? Because people are just messy. We have our stuff. We have our struggles. We uh, need to encourage one another and lift each other up. And that's exactly what this letter was. Now, I'll be honest, Paul kind of comes hard in the paint, the entire book, uh, because he's addressing problems. Uh, Paul didn't have time to sugarcoat things sometimes. He actually was just preaching the truth. And so I want to be faithful to do that, and I hope that, that we're encouraged and before I jump into even the text today, um, I don't know, man, I feel like this was just such a, a providential thing that God planned this series for where we are even as a church. I mean, we're still infants, right? We're two and a half years old. We were six months old when COVID hit. We're kind of coming out of that, it seems. And we were actually at a, a retreat this past week in Orlando. We took our team to a, a big church planting conference called Exponential. And the whole theme of the week was planting churches empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And if you were with us in the beginning, we really set out to plant a church to be that. We knew that if God's Holy Spirit, if his presence wasn't in our midst, then nothing we did mattered. I opened up a series when I first planted the church. We spent three weeks just talking about the worship and the presence of God. And we talked about how worship isn't worship without the presence of God. It's the key ingredient. If you don't know the meatloaf story, look it up like it was hilarious. And I'll share it again some other time. Um, actually, I'm just going to share it right now because it's funny. My very first point at this church was meatloaf is not meatloaf without meat, right? My wife had that. That was the very first point. Write that down. Take notes. It's amazing. It'll change your life. <laughs> we, tried, uh, we, we tried lentil loaf one time. Yeah, you can laugh. It's hilarious. It's disgusting and don't ever do it, right? <laughs> So the thing I hate about this whole movement of like meatless eating is they try to imitate meat things, right? It's like meatless meatballs or meatless meatloaf or, you know, whatever bean burgers or whatever they are, veggie burgers, right? I mean, some of those are actually pretty good. There are some pretty good bean burgers. But meatloaf made out of lentils, bro, it's disgusting. So anyways, the story was we were literally sitting at the table and I smell it. Granny Bates like famous recipe that was handed down to my wife. I smell it and I was excited. I thought we were having a cheat day on our vegan thing that we were doing, right? And so we get in and we get to the table and we sit down and our mouths are just salivating and we all literally, me and my kids, I remember it like it was yesterday, we take a bite and our, it's like we all dropped our forks just like what just went into my mouth? It was so underwhelming. And like in that moment, we had like a family meeting. We are going to continue to eat meat. We're done with this. Like this is, this is not okay. And so we don't do the vegan life anymore. Uh, we just try to limit meat and organic meat and lean meat and, and things like that. But my point was meatloaf is a meatloaf without meat. And it was really worship isn't worship without the presence of God. Amen. It is the key ingredients that makes it what it is. And so I want us to just... Really be in this posture. I believe God is asking us as a church in this season to be open-minded, to be open, open up our hearts, to, to be in this posture of just receiving, God, what are you doing? So much of the conversations that we were having at this conference is a lot of churches have been praying and moving and begging, God, can we just get back to where we were? Can we just get back to where we were pre-pandemic, pre-COVID and all that stuff? But I also sat in a bunch of these workshops, and let's be honest, where we were before wasn't that great. The church was not killing it for the kingdom. More people are leaving the church than ever before in the history of forever. The youth, the next generation, they're losing their faith, and they're walking away from Jesus more than ever. 
the percentage of people in this supposed country nation, their, their connection to the local church is worse than it's ever been. All COVID did was peel the Band-Aid off the disease that was already there and made it very obvious. And so we're in this season, I really believe that God is trying to move. God is trying to pour out his spirit. And one of the things that really just resonated with me was the Holy Spirit of God always shows up where he's welcome. The Holy Spirit of God always shows up where he's welcome. Are we begging for his presence? Are we begging for his spirit? Are we asking God to truly, supernaturally invade our bodies, invade our marriages, invade our families, invade our homes, invade our church so that we can invade this community and so on? Like it's just this movement. There's been historical revivals all throughout history, and it was always people of prayer on their face, welcoming and begging for the presence of God. And so I just felt stirred to just start planting these seeds. Uh, here in a couple weeks, even in this uh, series, we're going to be preaching on tongues and prophecy and gifts of the Spirit and all those things. So if you're interested, man, show up. It's going to be good. We're going to show you where we land, preach what the Bible preaches, and, and really walk through what does it look like, like Paul, to eagerly seek spiritual gifts. But before we get there, what we've covered so far is we've talked through a couple different problems. When he opens up the book, he talks about this problem of disunity. And his point was that the gospel of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit has to unite us. We are way too divided, way too quickly about really silly things in the church. And then it bleeds outside the church and it gets into all kinds of other areas where as Christians, when the world looks at us and is supposed to see the supernatural unity of people that love one another and share with one another and uplift one another and take care of one another, that's exactly opposite to what they see because we're all so divided over silly things. And Paul was saying the gospel of Jesus and the power of the spirit has to unite us. And then we spent a couple weeks talking about sexual sin. Uh, we talked about singleness. We talked about marriage. And, and the point was is that our purity matters. Our bodies matter. Our marriages matter. Our singleness matters. Our purity matters because God always moves in purity. And then when we're pure, when we pray, his spirit really moves and, and blesses obedience. And so we're trying to look at the church, what was off, what was broken, how can we respond? How can we humbly receive some of these areas that we all struggle with? Anybody else struggle with sin in here? I mean, raise your hand if you struggle, right? We have flesh. It's waging war against the desires of God. We're very easily distracted. We worry. We don't believe. We don't walk in faith. This is for all of us. And so when we come together, the hope is, is that we inspire one another, that God's word inspires you, that the presence of God in worship would inspire you to surrender to something other than yourself. And so when we look at singleness and marriage, sexual sin, all those things, we were just laying it out there. What did Paul say? So if, again, if you missed all of those you can go back and check them out. Today, the problem I want to talk about, I'm going to call food and freedom. So he gets into this really weird setup in chapter 8, and I'm going to jump around a little bit in 8, 9, and 10, just to really, I extracted just the main uh, point and purpose of what Paul was trying to get to in this. And so in chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to 8. I'm actually going to start in verse 8, but you can really just read through, and I hope you would go back and just read the entire book of Corinthians. But if you read and you get to chapter 8, he starts talking about this issue that the church was having. And they were talking about eating food that was sacrificed to idols. Okay, so we don't wrestle with this. Anybody know of any pagan worship temples around here that like kills animals and then like does a barbecue and like worships while they eat? Anybody? Not really, right? So culturally, this isn't like super uh, relevant, but I do believe there's principles in what he was talking about. And so I want to talk about for us, it's not food necessarily that is sacrificed to idols, but what does it look like to be a stumbling block to people that are trying to find God? Because what Paul was actually talking about in this passage was, he said, I don't want you to miss this when you have a pagan culture that worships a certain way and worships these false gods. The way that we act and the way that we move and the way that we talk matters if we're going to actually lead people to turn from these gods and follow the God, Yahweh, the creator God of the universe. And so this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 8, 
verse 8. He said, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and we're no better off if we do eat. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. And so I want you to hear this, that this idea of leading the weak is really he's talking about leading the weak away from Christ. He's talking about sinning against Christ whenever we become a stumbling block of people finding Jesus. When we claim to be Christian, when we claim to be followers of Jesus, when we claim that he's the king of our life, he's the Lord of our life, what God says goes, if he tells me to do it, I'm going to do it, and then we live another way, people look at us, and what's the word that the world loves to use when they talk about the Christians of their world? What do they say? Hypocrites, right? Say one thing, do another thing. Preach one thing, do another thing. Do what I say, not what I do, right? And this is the the world's perception of this. And Paul is really getting to this. And and, and I'm going to continue reading on because he he talks really in depth of what he's trying to get to. This is not about food. And I'll be honest with you, even today, this is not about behavior modification, I never want to stand up here and preach and just have a goal of, hey, you're acting one way. Let me get you to act another way. No, what I want you to see is God's principles that Jesus is better than any way, that God's word is better than any way, that God is good, that God is love, that God wants to bless you and fulfill you and give you all. And he says, if you will walk in me, if you will know me, if you will follow my statutes and my word, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to be with you. And so here's what Paul continues to say. I'm going to skip over to chapter 9. This is all in the same theme, and he just kind of clarifies what he's trying to do here. So 1 Corinthians 9, 19, he says this. For though I am free from all, and so he keeps using this freedom. Even in the first passage, he says that that you have this freedom, but don't exercise that freedom if you're going to be a stumbling block. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. He's saying that I might win more of them. He's talking about winning them to Christ, converting them from their idolatry to worshiping Jesus, worshiping Yahweh. He says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. He says, to those under the law, I became as those under the law. And then he clarifies, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as those outside the law to clarify not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessing. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as, a, as beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So his point is, is he's trying to win as many people to Christ as he can. And he knows that there's different cultures There's different contexts. There's different rules over here. There's different scenarios over here. There's different worship experiences over here. There's different styles over here. And there's all of these different things. And Paul was not thinking about his preference. Paul wasn't thinking about his freedom. Paul didn't use his salvation and his freedom to literally do whatever he wants. You guys have heard me say that. As believers, we can do whatever we want except sin. Think about that for a minute. You have the freedom in Christ to do whatever you want, 
except sin. And that's what Paul said. He says, to those outsiders, I lived as an outsider. But then he clarified, but not outside the law of God and Christ Jesus. Like we have to stay true to what we believe and we have to live out obedience. But outside of that, he doesn't care about your methodology. He doesn't care about your idolatry, or not idolatry, your ideology, your, your ideas, your methods, your styles, your preference, all of those. They're all good. So much in, in the church, we talk about mission and vision and strategy and all these different things. I loved this conference we just left because they said, hey, throw your strategy out the window and beg for the presence of God. People don't need a fantastically crafted message today. What we need is the word of God. We need his word. We need him to speak. We need God to move in supernatural ways. And so that's what Paul was saying. I'm going to be all things to all people that all might be saved. And I'm going to go to links. Whatever I have to do to win as many people as possible, that's what I'm going to do. He says, by all means. And then he keeps talking about exercising self-control in all things. And so there is this tension that we have to understand that like we have to control our bodies. We have to control our mind. When it comes to obedience and surrender, like we are in control of our actions. But how do we take care of that? I want to skip down to 10 and then I'm going to wrap all of this up in chapter 10 verse 31. He says this again. He says, so whatever you eat or drink... Or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. He said, give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I tried to please everyone in everything that I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that many, that they may be saved. He says it again, do all things to the glory of God. So here's the goal, win many. The goal is to win many. We want to win as many people to Jesus as possible. We want to point as many people as possible to the glory of Jesus. We want people to receive the truth of God and the word of God and the promises of God and the presence of God because that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to pour out himself on this earth so that we can be redeemed to God. And then through radical love and through radical faith, we can then invite other people into being in the presence of God. And not just here and now, but for all eternity. That we actually get to escape death and we get to be with God for all of eternity. There's this amazing reward in what we have to offer. But we can't say we believe one thing and then act as if we don't. We can't say that God is our provider and then not actually be generous and trust him to provide. We can't say that God is our healer and then worry all the time that we're going to actually be sick and fall apart and that God's not in control. And so again, we've got this conflict of faith happening all the time. Do we really believe what God says? Do we believe his word? Do we believe his promises? Are we trusting fully in him? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Then the strategy, so the goal is to win many. The strategy says all things to all people except sin. That's the strategy. Do whatever you have to, all things to all people that we can reach them. The discernment here, and we talk about this all the time, wisdom, caution, moderation, which really is summed up in this idea of self-control. And there's many things I can talk about in this scenario here of what does it mean for us? What's the food in our scenario? Alcohol, that's a really easy one for us to talk about. This is one that comes up all the time. Some of you may have noticed like our policy. We have a policy on our website with alcohol. And we're not one of those like don't drink because the Bible says it's a sin because the Bible doesn't say that it's a sin. Matter of fact, he says whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do it to the glory of God. Last I read, Jesus' very first miracle was to keep the party going at the wedding, right? They ran out of wine. Jesus like, I got you. 30 gallons. Here you go. Best wine. Have fun. But here's the thing. Have fun, but have self-control. Have wisdom. Have extreme caution. And don't forget who's in the room. Don't forget who's in the room. And so as believers, can you enjoy a glass of wine? 
Can you have a beer when you are playing golf with your buddies? Absolutely. I would say absolutely. And if you want to talk to me about it, I love this conversation because I believe it's very, very clear. We can talk offline. But what, what Paul is saying was, is if I'm playing with beer drinking buddies, I'm going to go have a, a beer with my buddies and play golf and try to reach many. If I'm at a, a party and they're bougie and they put their finger out and they drink wine tastings and eat cheese and olives, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drink wine and put my pinky out and, and have wine and olives so that I might win many. If I'm the bros and bourbon guy and I pull a pipe out and we want to smoke and talk theology, then that's what we're going to do because you know what? We want to reach many, but we're going to recognize who's in the room and we're going to have extreme caution and we're going to have extreme discernment and wisdom and we're going to operate not in sin because the scripture very clearly says to get drunk is sinful. So if you're drinking too many beers with your buddy, now you're in sin. You've crossed the line. If you're having too many bourbons with your buddy, now you're in sin. If you put your pinky out, you just look silly. But if you drink too much wine, you're in sin. Because the Bible's very clear on the moral law here of getting drunk is not okay. That's not how believers act. And I could go through a million different things. This is not just about alcohol. This is about a bunch of things. I mean, gluttony's a sin too. But I'm going to throw a party. I'm going to have food, right? But I'm going to be wise about it. I'm going to know who's in the room. And if I have a, a brother or somebody that I know is like struggling with like food addiction, then I'm probably not going to eat 15 Twinkies, or I'm not going to like indulge and like encourage, you know, all of this stuff. Do you guys ever see the movie, what was it, the, the Hunger Games, where they're at like this party and they have this like special drink where literally they're eating so much food that they take this drink so they can throw up just to eat more? Like that, this is kind of the culture that we live in. We just indulge and we take way too much in. What Paul is saying is, yes, you're free. But what he's saying is, is have caution, have wisdom. Don't cross the line of sin. Do whatever you have to do to reach many, but think about the people that you're trying to reach and be very intentional on what you're trying to do. And if you're taking notes, this is the big idea today. The message is about love over liberty. Love has to trump your liberty. And what I mean by that is you're free, yes, but never exercise your freedom at the expense of others. You're free to do whatever you want in the name of Jesus, all to his glory, but don't ever exercise that freedom at the expense of someone else. I remember one of my very first mission trips, we used to take a bunch of students up to Jamaica. And when we would go to this village, we would go into Ocho Rios and we would serve the community. And I remember like we were at Westridge at the time and we, you know, we could wear shorts and flip flops and like it was a super casual environment. There was no like religious dress code. Did anybody grow up in a church that had a religious dress code? I grew up in a church literally like if you're not wearing a tie, you're in sin. Like it's bizarre, right? But when you go to Ocho Rios, they had a custom and they had a culture and they had people and what they told us was, wear khaki pants, wear a button-down shirt, and tuck in your shirt. Now, did we have to do that? Was it sinful if we showed up in shorts and flip-flops? Absolutely not. We had all the freedom in the world to wear whatever we want. Jesus wore a robe and sandals. Like, come on, really? But we can show up and do whatever we want. But you know what we did? We brought khakis and closed-toe shoes, and we tucked in our button shirt. You know why? Because we were there to love them. We were there to serve them. And if me not tucking in my shirt and me not wearing shorts, if, if, if my attire was going to be a stumbling block to reach people for Jesus, then we were going to do whatever we had to do to reach people for Jesus. We were never going to exercise our freedom at the expense of other people. So Paul's saying, turn your brain on. Know who's in the room. Know who you're trying to reach. Have self-control. Be prayed up. Let the Spirit of God actually lead you so that many might be saved. And see, there's a deeper issue and, and principle here that, that Paul was really getting at. Because here's the deal. It wasn't about the barbecue. It wasn't about the meat. He kept talking about this food that was offered to idols because again, he had these pagan worshipers that would watch these sacrifices, watch this meat get cooked, and they would literally eat it to the glory of whatever God they were worshiping. 
And so he was talking about their conscience. Like if your weaker brother, he said, the one that you're trying to win to Jesus to lay down those idols and actually follow me, if he sees you and he knows that you know what that meat is and he watches you partake, maybe he thinks that that's okay. But for him, his conscience is worshiping other gods. And so what he was saying was, was don't do that. Don't exercise that. So really the principle that I want us to wrestle with this morning is this idea of idolatry. But see, we don't do this crazy animal barbecue sacrifice, but there's a lot of things in the world that we worship. There's a lot of false gods in this world that we worship. We talk about this all the time. There is a spiritual realm that is in existence. There are real spiritual beings, demons, angels, spirit things like evil, demonic forces. Paul says there's principalities and authorities and world systems, and there's a lot of things going on. This is something I pray that the Spirit of God removes the veil and lets us actually see that we're in battle. The reason this matters is because people might die, that there is an enemy that is seeking to kill still and destroy everything that we love, everything that we're trying to do. He's going to come in and he's going to create disunity. That's why we talked about it. He's going to come in and try to steer us with this deep desire towards sinful things and sexual things. And he's going to social media us to death, right? He's going to literally just fill us with all of this garbage so that he can destroy our lives. And so I wanted to ask just a question here. And let's take inventory of just humanity for just a second. And I'll even let y'all participate a little bit. If you look at the world today... What are some things based on what you see that they worship? What's some idols in the world? Maybe just throw a couple things out. What's some false idols? What's some false gods? What are, what are social media? Okay. What else? Sports. It's a good one. Children. Politicians. Preach, brother. Beauty. Youth. Celebrities. Money. Work, career, status, right? Themselves. That's my final point. So glad you threw that out there. (laughs) Come on. But let me ask you this. It's real easy to call those out when we're talking about them. When they look at us, who would they say we worship? This is a problem. This like sucks the the life out of the room a little bit. It's okay. You can breathe. God is gracious. He's patient. He's kind. He loves you. But he loves us way too much to leave us living lives like the world. He wants to supernaturally empower us to live out the purposes and the, the pleasure, the reward that God has for us. It matters how we talk. It matters what we post. It matters how we treat our bodies and how we talk about our bodies. It matters how we treat others. It matters how and where we spend our money. It matters what we watch. It matters what we value, what we do with our time, what we do with our treasure, what we do with our talent. It matters Let me see if y'all got 100%. I said we idolize sports, business, fashion, food, drink, politics, status, sex, pleasure, and individualism. Thanks for throwing that out. We worship ourselves. Can we just like confess all together that we are not the center of the universe? That all of our doubts, all of our fears, all of our questions. Anybody else read the book of Job? Tell me God doesn't drop a mic when he just lets Job just complain and whine and cry. And and, and listen, if anybody had a right to whine and cry and question God, it was Job. My family's never been lit on fire. My farm has never been just devoured. I've never had sores all over my body that I'm scratching them with, you know, broken pots. 
I've never had friends that just beat me to death with false prophecy all day long and just wear me out. My wife has never told me to curse God and die. But that's, this is who Job was, and Job was just pouring his heart out to God. And I love God when he was done. He was like, okay, you finished? Okay, now I want you to lace up your boots and stand up like a big boy. You ready? Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Can you speak and stars come to existence? Do you, do you put out the borders of where the oceans literally stop at the land? And he just goes on and on and on to talk about his magnificence, his power, his knowledge, his righteousness, his holiness. God is in control. This book is not about you. It's about God. Your faith, your obedience, your anything you do, it's not about you. It's all supposed to be about him. We're not the center of the universe. But how are we to be in the world, like the scriptures say, but not be of the world? Because we have to get in it. We have to be in it if we're going to reach many. To the Jews, we're going to be Jewish. To the Greeks, we're going to be Greeks. To the weak, we're going to be weak. To the non-believers, we're going to be the non-believers. But we're not going to sin. We're going to have self-control. We're going to live by the law of Jesus. We're going to be trumped and known by love. But we're going to radically pursue every environment that we can so that many might be saved. And one of the problems with our culture is they've brainwashed us to think that freedom means that you can do whatever you want. Man, that sounds really good. Anybody else a rebel like me? That just that sounds good. Like, don't tell me what to do. I want to do whatever I want. Freedom is I can do whatever I want. And we, and we popularize this by phrases like, you be you. Just do it. The heart wants what it wants. Follow your heart. Speak your truth. You do you, boo. <laughs> your truth. What does that mean? Think about these phrases that we hear them all the time. These are like, these are like mantras to live by. That there's this freedom that we can just do whatever we want. That we can define our own truth. That we can do literally just whatever we think is right or whatever feels good. I love this quote. I'm reading a book called Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. And I just want to read this to you. It's so good. He said, our deepest desires usually to become people of goodness and of love. And I would say that defines us. Does everybody want to be good and everybody want to be loving? Like I would hope so. That's at least a desire here are often sabotaged by the stronger surface-level desires of our flesh. This is exacerbated by a culture where the widespread wisdom of the day is to follow our own desires, not crucify them. But in reality, be true to yourself is the worst advice anyone could give you. And here's why. He says, giving in to... The desires of our flesh does not lead us to freedom in life, as many people assume, but instead to slavery. And in its worst case scenario, addiction, which is a kind of prolonged suicide by pleasure. This you do you, boo, mentality. This you live out your truth. You do whatever you want to do. Be free don't let government tell you how to live. Don't let pastor tell you how to live. Don't let Jesus tell you how to live. Don't let the word of God tell you how to live. Whatever feels good, whatever feels right, whatever feels true, you define your own reality and live in it and go seek whatever you desire. But the problem is, is those surface level desires are sabotaging your deeper level desires because everyone says, I want to be good and I want to be loving and I want to be filled with the presence of God. And I want God to use me in a mighty way that I can love my wife and my kids and my neighborhood and my friends. And I want to build the kingdom of God. My deepest desire is that. But if I live by my surface level desires, it's to eat too much. 
is to drink too much, is to chase after lustful things because they're really quick and easy, is to continually just walk in this cycle of let me get some now, let me get some now, let me get a little bit more and, and more is always better. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. My wife makes fun of me all the time. If one is good, two has to be better, right? And if two is good, three must be even better. And it just keeps going and we just keep wanting more and more. We feel this with our finances. We feel this with success. We feel this with all the things that the world idolizes. We feel it with all the things that we also idolize. And so the call today is are we willing to lay our idols down? And here's the thing. Sports, they're not bad. Food, they're not bad. All these things, business, fashion, drink, politics, status, sex, pleasure, even individualism, none of these things on their own is bad, but they're really bad gods. They're really bad gods. They pale in comparison with the God of the universe who gave you his word and gave you his spirit and met you in your mess and forgave you of your sins and redeemed you by his life, by his death, by his resurrection. He ascended and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He sent his spirit to literally dwell in us so that we can live and love and follow him so that by his spirit we can have self-control. Just like that runner, he says, I run for the race for this imperishable gift. I'm not like a boxer just shadow boxing all the time. I have intentionality with everything that I do. In every place that I am, I have caution and wisdom and discernment. And yes, we are free, but does love trump our liberty? Does love every time, does it trump the liberty and the freedom that we have in Christ? Because here's the reality. So many of us believe that, yeah, I said that prayer. Yeah, I got baptized. Yeah, I did. I checked a few boxes. Now I'm good. My salvation is checked. That box is checked. Now I can just go do whatever I want. Now I have the freedom to, you know, obedience doesn't really matter. Giving doesn't really matter. Serving doesn't really matter. Sharing the gospel doesn't really matter. Praying doesn't really matter. Being in a group, learning God's word, all the things that we're trying to do to surrender our lives in his presence with his people so that we can inspire and equip one another to live out the purposes that God has planned for us. Here's the question that I'm going to close with. What does love require of us? What does love require of you in your marriage? What does love require of you in your singleness? What does love require of you in your business? What does love require of you in all of these scenarios? Are we willing to sacrifice our desires, our privileges, the things that we've been given, the space that we occupy? Are we going to just live in this self-indulging freedom to pursue pleasure? Or are we actually going to lay that down and actually go love people because that costs us something? But here's the lie that the enemy loves. If you do that, then you're not actually going to be fulfilled. Because your money is going to be more fulfilling than your generosity. That your addiction is going to be more fulfilling than your obedience and surrender. That that sexual pleasure is going to actually be better than what God designed and in his way and in his time and in his setting. And there's all of these lies that are just debunking everything that we say we believe. The question is, what does love require of us in all of these scenarios? And are we willing to lay down our lives? Are we willing, like Romans 12, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God? Not to conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We've got to lay down some of our freedoms because real freedom comes in when you actually sacrifice self and let God actually fulfill everything that you desire. That's what real freedom is. That's what real liberation is, is to not be enslaved any longer to yourself, to not be enslaved any longer to your fleshly desires. Because all of those desires, all of those thoughts that lead to desires, that lead to action, lead to death and destruction 
and brokenness and pain that then lead to another source of strength and another source of pleasure that lead to death and brokenness and pain. And it's this endless cycle that we find ourselves in, just grasping for more when Jesus is saying, just grasp for me. God is saying, let me be enough for you. Have self-control by the power of my spirit. Lay down your freedoms for the sake of your weaker brother so that many might be saved. So what does love require of us? What does love require of us? And are we willing to sacrifice? I love that word sacrifice. To me, that summarizes the love of God. That he loved you so much that he sacrificed. Think about Jesus sitting on the throne. John says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And that very word that spoke all things into creation became flesh. Humbled himself from the glory of heaven to a stable. Humbled himself to serve and to love and to pour out his life, to sacrifice his godness so that we could actually be like him, so that we could be redeemed to him. So again, what does love require of us? Would you bow your heads? Can we just sit for a minute? And actually, if you would, open up your hands, maybe just right there in your lap. And just posture your heart, posture your mind towards God. And I want you to ask God to speak. Ask him to reveal to you, first off, how much he loves you. Ask him to be present. But I believe God wants to speak. And so I'm going to give us about 30 seconds. Just listen for the voice of God. so reminded of the prayers of David. Your word says he's a man after your own heart. And often you would see him crying out in prayer, God, search my heart. Search my mind. Search my motives. Is there anything in me that's off? Am I listening to you? Am I open to you? I really believe in you? Do I really trust that you're my provider? Do I really trust that Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer? Do I really believe that you're going to give me everything that I need if I seek first your kingdom? Do I really believe that you're worthy to be Lord of my life? God, search my heart. search our hearts what does love require of us are we willing to lay down our comforts lay down our freedom lay down our preference lay down our marriages lay down our kids lay down our extracurricular activities God if we have placed anything on your throne let us remove it Be seated on your throne. Give us balance. Send us more of your spirit. Give us more of your Holy Spirit that leads to self-control, that leads to humility, 
that leads to a place where we can not in guilt and shame confess, but just in, in a great expectation confess those things because we know that they're terrible gods. All of our idols, all of our false thinking, all of our ideologies, all of our strategies, our methods, all of the things that are just getting in the way of us being in your presence, radically loving our community, boldly proclaiming the gospel, being transformed by your word, being filled up by your spirit. God, I don't know who you're speaking to today, but fill them up with power. Meet her right in her seat and say, I love you and I haven't forgot about you. That I forgive you. That I believe in you. That you're not too far gone. Lay that down. It's not good for you. Pick this up. It's amazing for you. Holy Spirit, speak. Bring us back to our first love when the gospel was so real in our hearts and minds that it just burst inside of us. When we saw this glimpse of your kingdom and Jesus and his love on the cross and the power of his resurrection, that it excited us. Faith was exhilarating. But through life and through circumstances and through slowly fading and slowly turning, we've lost our way. Remind us, Holy Spirit, of the prodigal son that was just in the pig slop, gave up everything, went back to his father just maybe to get some crumbs on the table. God, we were the prodigal son. You were the father and you ran to us and you clothed us with your righteousness and you gave us the ring and you killed the fat calf and you threw a party because you were just pleased that we came home. Holy Spirit, lead us home this morning. Overwhelm us with your presence. Jesus' name.